most of you here today. I recognize a few faces, but I do know one thing about everyone in this room. We are all storytellers. Now, I've been telling stories and researching and teaching about storytelling for over 30 years, and you may not have delved quite so deeply into the topic, but you're telling stories every day of your life. Stories are how we make sense of the world. Stories are how we take an experience and remember it and then share it with others. Our stories are shaping us, they're inspiring us, and sometimes they're limiting us. So if I get one TED Talk in my life, I want it to be on stories. And in particular today, I want to talk about family stories. I want to share with you my favorite family story. I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of family stories. What are they doing? And then I want to encourage all of you to go out and gather more of your family stories. When I was a child, I learned about the story of George Williams. So this is George William. He was my mother's older brother. She's probably three in this picture. He's maybe five. Well, in 1937, when George William was eight and my mother was six, he was playing on the farm and he got a splinter in his finger. Well, it must have become infected because my grandmother took him to the doctor and the doctor said he does not need a tetanus shot. And within two weeks' time, he had passed away. The tetanus turned to lockjaw, and he died in Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, probably an excruciating death. Now, when I learned about this, I was fascinated. And I would say to my grandmother, tell me about George William. And she would go out in her garage, and on the little metal shelf, she would bring in this box. And she would take the items out of this box. She had packed away as much as she could of George William's life into that box. She had his baby book. She had his report cards from all of his years in school. There were a bunch of Valentines, which I can only guess came from the February before he passed away. She never really told me about the Valentines. She also kept things about his death. She kept the get well cards, but in two weeks' time, there couldn't have been many get well cards sent. She kept the obituaries. She kept the ribbons from the funeral flowers. They are carefully pressed and folded in a smaller box. And she even kept the splinter that had been in his finger. That's a really tiny envelope in the box. Well, my grandmother would tell me these stories again and again, anytime I asked. And when she was moving into an assisted living facility, she gave me that box. I always say it's the greatest gift I was ever given. She gave me that box because I had the stories. My mother didn't even know about that box. My siblings had no idea about that box. And after 10 years or so of using that box in my classes to talk about family stories or in workshops I put on, it occurred to me how odd it was that I owned that box when my mother was the person who had known him, who had loved him. So I made a shadow box for her out of a bunch of the items. So you can see his little bow tie, you can see his pocket watch, the big P, that's his marble bag. You can even see a lock of his hair that my grandmother had saved. And that box hung on my parents' wall for 25 years. So anytime anyone walked by and looked at it, they heard the story of George William. And every time I brought the box into my classes and told the story, people heard the story of George William. That is the power of what stories can do. So let's talk for a minute about the purpose of family stories, because it's not all stories are told, and it's not a coincidence that some last and some don't. They are doing important work in our families. 
One way we could think about this is to think about stories in terms of different contexts. There's a great book called Black Sheep and Kissing Cousins by a woman named Elizabeth Stone, and she breaks it into three different sections. And the first context she talks about is the family to itself. So these are the stories about our family definitions, who we are. Um, I know the women in my family are shoppers, and there are many family stories to tell about how we are shoppers. Her second section of the book is about the family to the larger world. So here's where you would get stories of assimilation and migration. Here's where stories about ethnicity would show up because what we do might be different from those around us. Certainly here's where the stories of racism would show up in a family. And then her third category is the individual to the family. So think about the roles that people play. Maybe it is the role uh, based on birth order. So were you the oldest child in your family? Are there stories about the responsibility placed on you? Were the youngest child possibly? Were you the black sheep of your family? Or do you know who was? Or maybe you were the golden one that could do no wrong. And your siblings are probably very quick to tell those stories. Another way to think about this is to think about genres. We don't normally think family stories in genres, but the Smithsonian Institute did this great book where they went all across the nation and they gathered hundreds of family stories. And what they found is no two families are alike and no two family stories are identical, but there were universals that arose that they called genres. So think about, here's an example, courtship stories. Every family has to have a courtship story. Do you know your family's courtship stories? How did your grandparents meet? How did your parents meet? If you're a parent, do your children know your courtship story? Or maybe that's not what resonates with you, but maybe it's the hero stories. Is there a hero in your story? Maybe somebody really, really famous, maybe a war hero, but maybe it's not something that dramatic. Maybe there is just one individual who did something that either impacted one person's life or maybe a community and they became a hero. Now the flip side of that coin is maybe you have stories about the rogues. Are there some in your family who did the bad deeds and are those stories told? It could be fortunes lost or fortunes gained, survivor stories. There are many different genres of family stories and some of them may fit well with your family. But the last way I want to think about it is, what are the functions of family stories? And I got this material from my colleague and friend, Dr. Mara Loeb, who, when I researched for this, I found that she did her own TEDx talk on family stories. You should check it out. L-O-E-B, Mara Loeb. Look it up. It's great. But she gave me a handout about different functions. And what we know is all stories entertain. We don't tell a story unless it entertains. It either makes us laugh or makes us cry, tugs at our heart, scares us a little. A family won't, uh, you won't tell a story if it has not some kind of entertainment level value. But they also mostly are teaching, teaching us life lessons, like get a tetanus shot if you get a splinter in your finger. Now, some of those lessons we're being taught regulate our behavior. So sometimes they tell you what you should or what you shouldn't do in a family. Elizabeth Stone's book that I mentioned earlier, she's got a great example of how far were you allowed to go? Think about your family stories. My grandfather homesteaded in Oklahoma. So a story like that tells me it's okay to go seek adventure. But some families, and you might identify with this, you don't leave the state. You maybe don't leave the community. And in some cases, you don't go very far from a single street in your town. Those are regulating your behavior. Certainly, along with teaching and regulating behavior, our family stories are transmitting family history. It's how we learn who we are and where we came from, you know, who all the players are. And you know who you are in the world when you learn a bit about who are the people you came from. There's a wonderful fluid function of family stories that they incorporate the new with the old. So babies are born. Marriages happen, experiences, new experiences come in, and we have to figure out a way to weave those in to our old family stories. And the final function is my favorite, and that is our family stories sometimes reconstitute those who are no longer with us. 
So George William's story, every time we tell it, breathes new life into this little boy who died in 1937. So I want to challenge you. I'm hoping that some of this sparked something in your mind. Did it make you start to think about some of your family stories? Go out and ask questions. And then after you've asked, listen very carefully. I think sometimes we assume that people in our family don't want to tell stories. I think the truth is, it's not that they don't want to tell the stories. I think it's that they assume nobody wants to listen. That's absolutely the case with my grandmother. If I hadn't said, tell me the story of George William, I might never have known about that box. I might never have known about the details of his life. So ask those questions. Now, I know how lucky I am that I have something like the George William box. And I'm also lucky because my mother was pretty good at documenting things. For example, she left us this, these cufflinks, and it's just on a little card, but it, it says, Cufflinks belonged to Charles Passwater, my uncle, killed in World War I. So I get a little piece of a story just by my mother leaving us that bit of information. I also know from her journals, and she was a pretty good journaler, that she wore those cufflinks when she graduated from nurse's training with her starched uniform, all looking all formal. You have to look all over the place and you have to mark things. This is a candy dish that's in my house now. Antique dealers will tell you, flip it over and look for the markings. And I have no idea if the markings on this dish make it valuable as an antique. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in that little piece of masking tape. Because at one point, we had to move all the furniture out of my family's uh, living room to put in new flooring because of my, my mother's failing health. And when we put things back, we added little notes. Add those notes now while you can. This note says, Mom and Dad's wedding gift, Dr. Hook, doctor of George William. Dr. Hook was on that baby book page that I showed you. He was there at George William's birth, and he's also the doctor that said he doesn't need a tetanus shot. And I'm fascinated that he was still a part of my family stories all the way into the early 1950s when my parents got married and close enough that he gave this gift to them as a wedding gift. Look in lots of places, because long before Ancestry.com, this is where the genealogy was kept. Now, this is the Randall Family Bible that I happened to be able to access. And one time I was looking through it, and way in the middle of it, I found this page, and it lists my grandparents' children. Now, my dad is the very bottom, Rex Leon Randall, born, he was born in 1924. If you look higher up, you'll see baby boy. He was born in August of 1905, and he only lived a week. When I showed that page to my father, he had no idea that there would have been an older brother. That story was never told, but it came really important to him. We traveled out to Oklahoma, where that baby was born, twice trying to find the grave markers. We never did. We found the house my grandfather built, but we never found that baby's grave. And it was important to my dad because it was a part of his family. I'm also really lucky that we have probably a couple of dozen of my dad's love letters to my mom while she was in nurse's training. And some of them are illegible. And we don't know all the people, but we recognize many family members. We recognize friends that stayed friends for decades. It's a treasure because it's a part of our story. And you might not have anything as dramatic as an eight-year-old boy dying of lockjaw. And you might not have access to your dad's love letters to your mom, but there's probably something that you don't yet know about. So go out, ask the questions, gather those stories, jot down notes. You think you'll remember, but you probably won't. So take good notes and then share those stories. It's the best way to spark a connection heart to heart in your family. So please tell your stories.